to provide a brief evaluation of the use of monetary policy as a means of escaping a recession. We're going to talk about how the decrease in interest rates resulting from an increase in the money supply may be relatively ineffective at stimulating aggregate demand under certain macroeconomic conditions. So before you watch this video, you want to make sure you've seen my videos on the money market and on the tools of monetary policy. It may also help to have watched some of the fiscal policy videos in the unit on fiscal policy from my website. So let's start with a look at the two diagrams that we need to conduct our evaluation of monetary policy today. The first one is the money market diagram, which was introduced in a previous video lesson. The labels on our axes for the money market diagram are interest rate on the vertical axis, and we're going to put a little uh, N here, which indicates the nominal interest rate and the quantity of money on the horizontal axis. The other diagram we're going to use to evaluate monetary policy is the loanable funds market, which shows the demand for private sector investment in the economy. The vertical axis on a loanable funds diagram is the real interest rate, which is a function of the nominal interest rate in an economy. Keep in mind that the real interest rate equals the nominal interest rate minus the rate of inflation that prevails in the economy. The horizontal axis in a loanable funds diagram is the quantity of loanable funds. Another way of saying that is the quantity of funds demanded for investment in the economy at any given time. So in a previous lesson, we saw that the demand for money in the money market is downward sloping, reflecting an inverse relationship between the nominal interest rate and the quantity of money demanded as either an asset or for transactions to buy goods and services in the economy. The money supply, on the other hand, is vertical since it is determined by the monetary policies of the central bank. Our money supply curve is vertical. Our money demand curve is downward sloping. In the market for loanable funds, we will see that the demand for investment in the private sector is downward sloping. So the demand for investment curve reflects an inverse relationship between the real interest rate in the economy and the quantity of investment demand. Now this was explained in our previous video on the crowding out effect. The loanable funds market is explained in great detail in that video. So if you want to learn more about the demand and supply of loanable funds in the economy, go back and watch the video on the crowding out effect in our unit on fiscal policy. But we're not interested in fiscal policy today. What we're concerned with is the effectiveness of monetary policy and when it may or may not actually lead to an increase in aggregate demand during a demand deficient recession. So in our video on the tools of monetary policy, we discuss the different ways that a central bank can stimulate aggregate demand during times of recession. So let's review those tools of monetary policy now. During a recession, when aggregate demand is weak, a central bank wants to increase the money supply. There are three essential ways a central bank can do this. Increasing the money supply can be accomplished by lowering the discount rate, the next tool of monetary policy that could achieve an increase in aggregate demand is lowering the reserve requirement. And the third and most commonly used tool of expansionary monetary policy is when the central bank buys government bonds from the commercial banking system. So these are the three basic tools of monetary policy. And if we look at the simple diagram of the money market and the loanable funds market, we can illustrate the effect of any of these three tools given a normal downward sloping investment demand curve like that which you see on the right. Let's assume, for example, that the economy is in recession and the central bank engages in an open market purchase of government bonds. Notice that in our money market diagram on the left, we start with an equilibrium interest rate of IRE and an equilibrium quantity of money demanded of QE. If the central bank increases the supply of money through an open market purchase of government bonds, we'll see the money supply shift to the right, as we can see here, to SM1. This increase in the reserves in the banking system will cause the equilibrium interest rate to fall to IR1 and the quantity of money demanded 
to increase to QM1. Now, how did this expansionary monetary policy affect the level of investment demand in the economy? Let's go back to our original equilibrium interest rate of IRE. Assume that there is no inflation in this economy, or assume that inflation is stable at 1% or 2%. Either way, the real interest rate is going to be a function of the nominal interest rate. So we can correlate the original interest rate of IRE with the particular real interest rate in our loanable funds diagram, which would then correspond with the particular level of private sector investment, which I will call QI1. The expansionary monetary policy, which shifted the supply of money out, drove down that nominal interest rate. And assuming there was no major change in the rate of inflation, the interest rate that private borrowers face will also fall, leading to an increase in the quantity of funds demanded for investment to QI2. Now it's this increase in investment demand, rather in the quantity of funds demanded for investment, that is intended to stimulate aggregate demand and shift the economy back towards its full employment level of output. That's what's supposed to happen. That is how expansionary monetary policy is supposed to work. But what we need to discuss now is the circumstances under which this effect may not actually occur. Under what circumstances will a decrease in the interest rate not lead to an increase in private sector investment and therefore not lead to an increase in aggregate demand? If we can identify these circumstances, if we can figure out what scenario would lead to an ineffective expansionary monetary policy, then we may be able to determine when fiscal policy is necessary. So I'm going to clean up this graph now, and we're going to start over with a different view of investment demand. We're going to say, what if investment demand in the economy is exceedingly low for some reason? How will the increase in the money supply affect investment demand if it happens to be very low? So let's reconsider the demand for private sector investment in our loanable funds market. Let's consider the possibility that we are in a deep recession and that the private sector is feeling very uncertain about future business opportunities. We could say that business confidence is low, that there might even be some deflation in the economy, and therefore firms expect the prices of their goods to fall in the future. In such a deflationary, recessionary environment, it would not be unreasonable to think that the demand for private sector investment is in fact very, very low. And in addition, that private sector investors, in other words, firms thinking of investing in capital, will be relatively unresponsive to decreases in the interest rate that they face in the economy. So let's, let's draw a scenario in which the private sector investment demand curve is relatively inelastic, but in addition, it is very low. In other words, it is further to the left than the first investment demand curve that we drew. So here we can see a demand for investment curve that has shifted far to the left and become much steeper than that which we saw in the previous graph. Also notice that the investment demand curve dips below the horizontal axis. In other words, the interest rate of 0% there is a range of interest rates below 0% at which the quantity of funds demanded for investment would start to increase more dramatically. Now, what does this mean? How do we interpret this? How can you have an interest rate of minus 1% or minus 2%? Well, in all reality, there cannot be a negative nominal interest rate. Just the idea of this is relatively absurd. The idea that banks would pay you to borrow money from them. This is very unrealistic, and banks have never really offered a negative interest rate. However, a negative real interest rate, keep in mind that the loanable funds market illustrates the real interest rate and how investment demand responds to changes in the real interest rate. Negative real interest rates are possible. How is this the case? Well, if the nominal interest rate is very low and there is inflation in the economy, then a negative real interest rate is possible. Here's an example. What if the nominal interest rate is 1% and there is a 3% rate of inflation? Keep in mind that the real interest rate equals the nominal interest rate minus the rate of inflation. So in the case of a 1% nominal interest rate and a 3% inflation rate, we would see 
a real interest rate of negative 2% in this case. During recessions, however, there is rarely high inflation. During recessions, inflation is likely to be close to 0%. So let's make an assumption here that inflation is very low or even close to being negative, And investment demand is very weak due to low business confidence and the expectation of future deflation. Under this circumstance, how will an increase in the money supply caused by an expansionary monetary policy affect the quantity of investment demand in the economy? Let's look again at the same increase in the money supply that we showed in our previous analysis. The interest rate is going to fall from an initial level of IRE, which corresponds with a quantity of investment demand of QI1. And as the interest rate falls to IR1, we're going to see that due to the relatively weak investment demand in the economy and due to the fact that investors are not very responsive to changes in the interest rate, the quantity of investment demand is only going to increase slightly to QI2. So why doesn't the central bank just keep increasing the money supply? Let's show the effect of a further increase in the money supply say to SM2. Here we can see the interest rate, the nominal interest rate is very close to zero. It's down here at around 0.5%. Call that IR2. Even at interest rates of 0.5%, there is relatively little change in the quantity of private sector investment. Businesses are simply unresponsive to further decreases in the interest rate. And what happens? Let's say the central bank continues to increase the money supply. Bear with me here. We're going to increase the money supply even further. Notice that we can't actually do that. Increasing the money supply any further will result in a nominal interest rate of 0%. An increase to SM3, we have now reached a 0% nominal interest rate. Remember, nominal interest rates cannot fall below 0%. So there will simply be a point at which, on our investment demand curve, there will be no further increase in investment. Interest rates cannot fall below 0%. Now, the only circumstances that might lead to further increases in investment, in other words, further movement along our investment demand curve, is if inflation is positive. Only if inflation is positive will we have a negative real interest rate when nominal interest rates have reached 0%. Now, how, what are the chances that inflation will be positive? Keep in mind, during deep recessions, this is highly unlikely. During deep recessions, we would expect 0% inflation or maybe even deflation as we saw in the United States and Europe throughout the Great Recession. When inflation rates are close to 0%, at 0% or below 0%, then monetary policy becomes very ineffective. Because even when the central bank decreases nominal interest rates all the way down to 0%, there is very little incentive for firms to invest in an economy in which inflation is 0% or negative. A deflationary environment is the worst environment for businesses to invest in. So what are the implications of this analysis of a highly inelastic demand curve and a very low level of investment demand during recessions? Well, all of this points to the fact that during recessions, monetary policy may be very ineffective. Of course, decreasing the interest rate requires that businesses respond to lower interest rates. However, if the responsiveness of businesses to changes in the interest rate is very weak, and if investment demand is very low, then decreasing interest rates during recessions may lead to very little increase in the private sector investment. Ultimately, therefore, a decrease in the interest rate caused by expansionary monetary policies may have little or no effect on the actual level of aggregate demand in the economy. So monetary policies may be effective if investment demand is relatively strong and if investors, by which I mean businesses thinking of buying capital, are relatively responsive to changes in the interest rate. These conditions are very unlikely to be met during deep recessions, however. Therefore, one thing we can conclude is that monetary policy is relatively effective during weak recessions when investment demand has not fallen dramatically, and investors are still responsive to changes in the interest rate. However, during deep recessions, when we expect business confidence to be low, when we expect inflation to be low or even negative,
in these circumstances, investment demand is likely to be weak and relatively inelastic. Therefore, monetary policy is going to be relatively ineffective. This leaves us with other options, of course, and to learn how fiscal and supply side policies can be used to correct the negative consequences of recessions, you need to go back and watch some of those videos on fiscal policy and the last video I made on the supply side policies.